Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society. CBC's Fifth Estate just did a documentary which they called Boiling Point Climate Chaos. And I think that it's an example of very poor journalism. I'd like to show you why. And I think there's also a very serious aspect of this documentary wherein, to my mind, CBC actually incited violence against critical infrastructure in Canada when there was really no need to make any comment in that regard. So um, let's walk through the presentation and um, you'll see what my comments are, see if you agree or not. The fact-free CBC Fifth Estate Green Propaganda <laughs> Deconstructing Boiling Point Climate Chaos. Now before we get into this, let's just talk a bit about the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the body of scientists that create what often is referred to as the Climate Bible. They put together a very large set of reports every six years, which outline um, their views on human-caused climate change, what influences are at work, and what impacts are being felt, and also what potential mitigations could be offered. But one of the most important things that the IPCC has ever said is that in climate research and modeling, we should recognize that we are dealing with a coupled, nonlinear, chaotic system, and therefore that long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. So when people tell you what the temperature is going to be in 2100, the IPCC has just told us that they can't do that. It's not possible. And what exactly is climate change? We hear many people talk about climate change all the time. Greta talks about it. Uh, many uh, young people, many teachers, many politicians, uh, lots of journalists talk about climate change. But do they really know what it means? Because the scientific definition of climate change is a change in the state of climate that can be identified by using statistical tests by changes in the mean or variability of its properties and that persists for an extended period, typically decades or longer. Now this is an important point because people often say, oh, look, it, we had a lot of wildfires last year. That's one year. That's not climate change. That's an anomaly. So uh, when people are attributing certain extreme weather events or wildfires, they're not talking about climate change. But here's the opening image from the Fifth Estate show. And on February the 16th, 2024, CBC's Fifth Estate did a sheer propaganda piece for Big Green. CBC confidently claims our planet is getting hotter. And Susan Ormiston says fires, floods, heat domes, as those are supposedly examples of climate change. Our planet is getting hotter with tragic results. Over 600 people died and one of them was my sister. That's referring to a heat dome interview that they did with a woman who lost her sister in that um, time period. But in fact, if we look at what Roger PLK Jr. has to say about wildfires and the IPCC and the media, he says that the IPCC Climate Bible does not attribute wildfire to human-caused climate change. Why do you? The IPCC has not detected or attributed fire occurrence or area burned to human-caused climate change. Likewise, Dr. Madhav Kandekar, our scientific advisor, has a whole presentation on our website called Climate Change and Extreme Weather perception versus reality. And he talks in depth about how people constantly conflate and confuse extreme weather events with climate change. They're not the same thing. And of course, 
we should look at some scientists with a bit more common sense, like Mike Hume. I would say he is a mainstream climate scientist. He is concerned about climate, but he's more concerned right now about climatism, about how everything is being attributed to climate change. And in his new book, he says, he reveals how climatism has taken hold in recent years, becoming so pervasive and embedded in public life that it's increasingly hard to resist it without being written off as a climate denier. And I compare this here to Covering Climate Now, which is a journalistic program that includes about 500 media outlets around the world, and they have an audience of something like 2 billion people combined, and they're real, really <laughs> into climatism. So this is one of their um, statements that they suggested to journalists that people should use these 15 simple words for better climate coverage. And um, what they suggest is that drawing the connection between extreme weather events and climate change requires only 15 words. Extreme heat is driven by climate change. Climate change is driven by burning fossil fuels. Or perhaps you can do it in even fewer words. As Al Gore put it in a new TED Talk, the climate crisis is a fossil fuel crisis, which is untrue. So in CBC's show, their fact-free evidence consists of interviews with climate activists. So they interviewed uh, Catherine Abreu, who said we need to be talking about climate change. They interviewed Sophia Mather, who said when all else fails, sue. They interviewed a fellow from um, India who said that, and he's working with the uh, Climate Action Network, who said that uh, he uh, had gone to COP, and there he is at the COP28 with more fossil fuels means more loss and damage. Uh, which is not true. And they also interviewed Peter Kalmus, who is a climate scientist with NASA and also author of this book. So CBC also amplifies conflicting views on climate policies instead of presenting facts. So they did interview Premier Dan Daniel Smith of Alberta and uh, they framed it as this, uh, the face-off between Alberta's Premier and the Federal Minister of Environment, Stephen Gilbo. They frame it as the political brawl over our heating planet. But does CBC fact-check Minister Gilbo? No. And he said the Premier of Alberta turned this into a culture war. But in fact, if you look at the actual data, you can see that fact-free CBC does not provide information that people need to evaluate the claims. This graph is from the International Energy Agency and it shows Canada's total energy supply. And you can see that most of it comes from oil, hydro, natural gas, and coal. Wind and solar are very, very uh, small on this graph. We also have quite a bit of hydro and nuclear, but that's not presented to us. So we're told that Premier Smith has created a culture war when in fact there are very serious implications for the policies that Minister Gilbo is trying to impose upon Alberta, especially Alberta. So if we look at these graphs, which are from our world in data, anyone can download them, you find that in terms of the global energy consumption by source, again, it's coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, hydro, wind and solar are very, very small on this graph, and there's also quite a big chunk of traditional biomass. That would mean burning dung or wood scraps, which most of the world, the developing world, that's what they have to use for energy. And if you compare these two different graphs, the second graph is about the life expectancy globally and in world regions since 1770. 
And you can see that from about 1950, I added those uh, red markers there, um, longevity has shot up around the world, as has um, the use of fossil fuels. So energy equals life, health, and longevity. And this is global data, but why didn't CBC show this to viewers? And why didn't CBC talk with actual um, energy experts like Professor Emeritus Václav Smil? This image is from um, a presentation that he did a few years ago to the McGill engineering uh, groups. Um, and he said, I want to leave you with five messages to take away. We are a fossil-fueled civilization. He says that about five times. <laughs> then he says, we shall remain so for a long time to come because energy transitions take a great deal of time, scale matters, and so does energy density, power density. So they, they should have talked with him, perhaps, rather than only talking with activists. And for instance, here's Alberta. This is a bad day for wind and solar versus a good day in Alberta. So if you look at the uh, left-hand side of the screen, you can see that on September the 30th, 2023, it was a bad day for wind. Because if you look under maximum capability, you could see that wind could potentially put out 20% of the power generation in Alberta. But that day, there was no wind or really 7%, that's all. So natural gas had to fill in for that. There was also very little solar that day. So that's why we need the natural gas, because without it, we'll go to blackout. And on the other side, you can see a good day. So wind was actually performing on February the 25th, 2024. Wind was performing at 15% when its total capacity is 21%. So that's very good. Solar was actually at 8% and its maximum capability is 8%. Very good. But this is not consistent. It's unreliable. That's why we need natural gas, because it's what, we, what is called dispatchable power, just like a gas stove. You know, you can turn it up or down as you need, but you can't do that with wind and solar. So the risk of rolling blackouts in Alberta is very real unless we have equivalent natural gas backup. And that's something that Minister Gilbo rejects and something that was not presented at all in the Fifth Estate documentary. Now, we have to understand that the east-west power grid has been a liberal fixation since 2005. And they think that it would be very simple and cost-effective and that it would work really well to just hook up all the provinces, string them all together, you know, kind of like Lego, um, and then we could have hydropower from Quebec flowing into Alberta when the wind isn't blowing. We could have wind power from Alberta flowing into Quebec when there's lots of wind in Alberta, that type of thing. But that's unrealistic. Because weather-dependent power is unreliable, and that's not just wind and solar. It's also hydro, and you can actually see this right now. This is probably one of the most important warnings that Canada could get right now, that drought is causing BC utilities to imp import more power. So BC, which effectively runs a uh, very high percentage on hydro. Um, it's in a drought right now. <laughs> so they have to import power from the states. And Quebec faces a big energy shortfall after wooing the U.S. to buy cheap hydropower. So they've made these commitments that now are difficult to keep because they're um, getting close to capacity. And in Manitoba, Premier Kinu dismisses warnings about looming capacity crunch at Manitoba Hydro. They're running out of hydro. And Muskrat Falls in the Atlantic provinces 
Vibrations inside the turbine at Muskrat Falls hydroelectric dam raise concerns. So, you know, hydro is completely weather dependent. When it works, when the dams are full and we've got lots of water, fantastic. When we're in an El Nino year, or if there's other kinds of trouble with the dam, then we're in trouble. So if we look at the facts about Canada, if we look at total energy generation by source for electricity alone, this is also from the IEA, we can see that Canada is already a clean power nation. And those of you who are thinking that tomorrow or by 2030 we could be running off wind and solar, take a good look at this graph because you can see down in the corner there's a tiny little area for wind and an even tinier area for solar. It took us a hundred years to build up a grid that runs with this kind of fossil fuel power, nuclear and hydro. And you can see that hydro is a huge chunk here. But that's not going to be replaced in the next 5 or 25 years by wind and solar. Obviously that's impossible. And CBC Fifth Estate was wrong to claim Southern Europe was burning up because that was one part of their documentary. They claimed that Southern Europe was really in trouble and last year was the hottest year ever. But these facts are not supported by the evidence. CBC was wrong to promote the idea of more loss and damage from fossil fuel use. And you can see in these graphs that the wildfire in um, Mediterranean region last year was on a par with other years, lower than 2018. Uh, and you can see that the losses were also not very significant compared to, say, 2018, 2017. And I think, worst of all, CBC exploited the sorrow of an activist. This poor woman, her sister passed away during the heat dome um, of 2021. And of course, she misses her terribly. And uh, she believes quite fervently that dependency, denial, delay, and disasters equal death. So she's talking about the delay in phasing out fossil fuels. But in fact, the heat dome was caused by a mobile polar anticyclone, which is a natural event. And we have a whole presentation on this. Here are some excerpts of it. And it really, the heat dome had an element in it that was very uh, similar to the Föhn mountain wind effect. And this is rather like a Chinook wind, but it had kind of parked right over BC, especially like that Lytton area. Um, and that was a big contributing factor to the wildfire there, um, which took out the town. Mind you, Lytton has burnt down a few times before, so it's in a high-risk area. If we look at the heat dome, we can see that it was not human-caused climate change. It was just Mother Nature. So if you look closely at this map of the time, you can see the mobile polar anticyclone. You can see there's a very hot area that is parked right over um, the Pacific Northwest. But at the same time, if you look, you can see down below, there's a very cold um, kind of arm that reaches down. And, you know, no one was talking about that extreme cold, seasonal cold for that time of year that was down in uh, the Texas area. They only talked about the heat dome. But you see, this is a... Um, a natural phenomenon. It's not caused by human-caused climate change. It's not caused by your SUV or CO2 emissions. So why did CBC interview Peter Kalmus? Well, Peter Kalmus believes we're in a climate emergency. And as I mentioned before, this is his book. He's a scientist who, climate scientist who works with NASA. And he takes the train whenever he has to commute from North Carolina to Nassau, believing that that reduces his emissions because he's not flying. Um, I'd question that, but 
Anyway, Kalmus book is predicated on the implausible scenario RCP 8.5. And uh, here's a page from his book where, in fact, he states that RCP 8.5 is the business as usual scenario, um, which is completely untrue. Now, to his credit, uh, Peter Kalmus has actually modified his life. Apparently, he rides his book everywhere, uh, his bike everywhere. Apparently, he rides his bike everywhere, he or walks. He uh, leads a very low carbon life, so he's walking the talk. That's great, um, but I don't know that I want to modify my life in that way, especially when his thesis is built on an implausible scenario. So this graph shows the RCPs. These are representative concentration pathways. They refer to a number of different parameters, such as population, use of fossil fuels, the um, sensitivity of carbon dioxide as a warming agent. And you can see that if we were on the RCP 8.5 pathway, it would definitely be kind of spooky, wouldn't it? Kind of frightening. But we're not. Because RCP 8.5 is implausible. Now, first of all, these scenarios were developed for research. They were never meant for policy making, but because people like to have some kind of a guide or a pathway, they've adopted them as if these are choices that we should make. And in fact, the Canadian Climate Institute issued a report re uh, which referred to the choices that we could make referring to these different scenarios. But these are not choice scenarios. These are simply scenarios developed for use in the laboratory to understand climate change and to understand the different impacts. And that's why they changed up some of the elements. But what did they change? Let's look and see. So. This is from a report by Robert Lyman, where he sort of wrote in plain language why RCP 8.5 isn't such a um, valuable tool for evaluating our future. Because he points out that the UN projects population to be about, world population to be about 9 billion by 2100, but RCP 8.5 assumes it would be between 12 and 15 billion. <laughs> So that's quite a bit more. So the population projections in the other RCPs are within 90% of the UN projections, but RCP 8.5 is well outside it. Also, RCP 8.5 stood out especially because of its assumptions concerning global fossil fuel use in 2100. So Robert writes that actual coal use was less than 200 exajoules in 2020 and almost all authorities project it to be stable or declined by 2100 because of the combined effects of lower costs for competing energy sources such as natural gas and renewables and ever-increasing government regulation. RCP 8.5, in contrast, assumed that coal use would increase to over two, or, or, sorry, 800 exajoules that global coal use would increase to over 800 exajoules. With respect to oil, under RCP 8.5, world crude oil production in 2100 would have to be about four times that of 2015 to meet the assumed demand. That means oil companies would have to find and produce roughly four trillion barrels of crude oil between now and 2100. So that's about twice the level of proven crude oil reserves now, plus the current estimate of technically recoverable resource potential. So that would be a Herculean task and basically impossible to do. Um, likewise, there are many commentators who look at RCP 8.5 and say, well, actually, they're predicting that we would burn more coal than exists on Earth. So that's not very realistic either. So the climate emergency, as we now see, actually stems from the misuse of this graph. And if you take away RCP 8.5 and RCP 6, there's just no climate emergency. 
So we do have time. And it is very interesting that these two green billionaires who are very into renewables and carbon trading are the ones behind a report called Risky Business, which pushes RCP 8.5 as the business as usual scenario. So that's how things have gotten all mixed up here. Now more recently, Judith Curry, who's also a climate scientist, has testified to the U.S. Senate that the climate crisis isn't what it used to be. Um, now, she's pointed out that at these climate meetings, which are called COPs, the Conference of the Parties, uh, that means the people, the countries who signed on to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, at the most recent one in uh, COP26 in 2021 and COP27 in 2022, they dropped consideration of the RCP 8.5 scenario. So they don't even consider it anymore. And yet CBC is uh, still pushing it. The scientist that they interviewed pushes it in his book. Um, and probably all the climate activists that they refer to are also relating to RCP 8.5. Perhaps they don't know this, but now they do. But it is odd that CBC didn't do any research to find this information because it's not that hard to find. I found it. So NASA, what's your carbon footprint? Yes, we have Peter Kalmus, who is taking the train to work when he has to go in. He generally works remotely. And he's saying that he's watching the planet basically get hotter and hotter. Well, what do you think the carbon footprint of NASA is? Now, I did find this one little bit from Quora saying that NASA's carbon footprint is approximately 10,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. That's just their total electricity use. But when you think of all the things that NASA makes, they have a huge supply chain of all kinds of little parts and specialty items. Some of them are custom made for all of their space research. Um, that's a huge carbon footprint. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Um, Peter Kalmus is doing everything he personally can to reduce his carbon footprint, working for an organization that has a huge carbon footprint, and almost everything they do must, by necessity, have a large carbon footprint. And he said it's getting hotter and hotter but actually it looks like that's false. So this little montage was put together by Don TJ90, who's on um, Twitter. <clears throat> but she points out that uh, in uh, March 29th, uh, 1988, in the New York Times, uh, Dr. James Hansen was saying that uh, the global average temperature was 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. But meanwhile, we see that by 2019, the temperature averaged 14.85 degrees Celsius, or 58.71 degrees Fahrenheit, or the global average temperature in 2020, according to the World Meteorological Organization, was 14.9 degrees Celsius, so, or 58.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So it seems like it's not getting hotter. So one of the most serious things that I think CBC did in boiling point climate chaos is that they engaged in incitement. So Susan Ormiston is interviewing Peter Kalmus and she presses him, do you accept blowing up pipelines? And he responds saying nonviolent actions against infrastructure are okay by him. Well, you know, if you destroy infrastructure that provides critical services, many hundreds or thousands of people will die. And CBC doesn't explain that because the repairs could take months or years. So if you blow up a critical infrastructure pipeline in the middle of winter, that could deny people 
the necessary energy they need to heat their homes or run their hospitals um, or keep their um, loved ones safe in a home care facility. Um, and there was no reason that I saw for Susan Ormiston to literally put these words in Peter Kalma's mouth. Furthermore, CBC irresponsibly did not address the consequences of such a radical move. Um, I think that's unforgivable. And then CBC gives the floor to Gavin Newsom, who's the governor of California. And he says, the oil industry has been playing us for fools for years. But in fact, if we look at the US um, Energy uh, Information Administration, we find that uh, the quick facts are that California was the seventh largest producer of crude oil among the 50 states. It's the third in crude oil refining capacity. It's the largest consumer of jet fuel the second largest consumer of gasoline in among the 50 states. Uh, in 2020, it was the second largest total energy consumer among all the states. Its per capita energy consumption was less than in all but three other states. But that's probably because it's quite warm there. <laughs> Um, in 2022, renewable resources, including hydro and small-scale customer-sided solar power, accounted for 49% of California's in-state electricity generation. Now that sounds fantastic, until you realize that they had to build up more natural gas fuel power stations for another 42%, and nuclear supplied almost all the rest. Um, they also import a lot of electricity from coal-fired states. In 2022, California was the fourth largest electricity producer in the nation, and the state was also the nation's third lar largest electricity consumer, with additional needed electricity coming from out-of-state generators. So if the oil industry has been playing people as fools for years, well, sounds like the oil industry has made California into the economic powerhouse that it is. So what kind of fools are they? And, um, you know, there are some lawsuits going on against Big Oil, and Big Oil's response, at least from Chevron, which was also in the CBC show, was that uh, calls for coordinated global policy response, not piecemeal litigation benefiting attorneys and politicians. And you can see here in the corner, this graph shows that China is the largest emitter in the world. So of course it calls for a coordinated global response. You can't just pick on oil companies and sue them in your own jurisdiction when uh, China is the world's largest emitter and India is hot on its heels. And CBC also claimed that 2023 was the hottest year on record. First of all, they didn't say what period of time that record was. And of course, maybe they've never heard of the dirty 30s, which was definitely the hottest period on record. Then they go on and say, meet Sophia Mather. Well, here she is. This is from uh, an eco-justice website. Uh, this is showing her when she was 15. And now you can meet Sophia Mather and her mom and Al Gore, because it seems like they're all friends. And Sophia's mom is even on the We Don't Have Time Foundation board with Greta. And you can see that Kathy Orlando, who is Sophia's mom, is the director of Citizens Climate Lobby in Canada. Citizens Climate Lobby is the reason why you have carbon tax and rebate. Um, because they lobbied for that very successfully. And they like to call the rebate climate money. <laughs> now, it was your own money, so it's tax them and bribe them with their own money. But they think it's a great plan, and they worked very hard on that. Um, now, we don't have any of this information from the Fifth Estate, do we? Because that might change how you see this um, 
alleged young climate activist going to court to sue the Ontario government for not taking climate action. Uh, might be worth people's while to have a look at Manufacturing of Greta Thunberg, which was written by the left-wing journalist um, Corey Morningstar. Very good concentration of information, I think. And why didn't CBC interview the climate science expert witness in Sophia's case? So this is from previous uh, work that we did. This is when they first went to court. Seven young people sued Ontario over its climate policy. This week they made their case. And here we have the Citizens Climate Lobby Canada. Uh, this is an excerpt about Sophia, that she's been an activist since she was seven. At that time she was 15, so eight years as an activist. But in fact, Ontario's expert witness received his PhD in 1986. So at that time, he'd been a scientist for 36 years. So you'd think you'd want to talk with him. And here he is. Why didn't CBC interview Professor Van Wingarden? He's an eminent Canadian scientist. Um, they, in, in previous coverage of the Ontario court case, CBC just called him a climate change denier, um, even though he's an internationally recognized physicist. Now, if you talk with many climate change activists, they will tell you that climate change is basic physics. So, you know, if you have basic physics, then you know what climate's all about. But he's an internationally recognized physicist, and they call him a climate denier because they say, well, he's not a climate scientist. But in fact, he's a scientist, so he can assess climate science because he has the skills and knowledge to do so. So he's noted for his excellence in teaching complex topics like math. He does leading edge science for us here in Canada. He's the author of a book, Acknowledging Climate Change is Real. He thoughtfully questions the hype on catastrophe and relative human influence. He is signatory to the Clintel World Declaration that there's no climate emergency and that we do have time and that Mother Nature is more influential on climate than humans. And he has a 61-page CV and CBC doesn't mention any of these facts. <laughs> so we did a four-part series exposing the child exploitation by the climate change movement and you can see that on our blog. We've got videos and the PowerPoints there. Now, Professor Van Wingarden also has a 43-page paper on climate change in Ontario, which was, I believe, prepared for this very court case. And of course, CBC didn't bother to show us that, did they? Um, here are a few points that he makes in this paper, that Ontario's contribution to anthropogenic sea level rise is about 0.005 millimeters a year. And yet the sea level along Ontario's Hudson Bay coast is decreasing due to isostatic rebound of the land following the last ice age. You know, that's when, because all the ice melted and it was very heavy because there were miles of ice, um, slowly the land rebounds. And so it actually isn't sinking, it's not subsiding, and the sea level rise is not that relevant because it's rebounding in that area. Um, he points out that ocean acidity due to CO2 absorption is negligible, uh, that there's no changes in precipitation in North America over the 19th and 20th centuries, nor at Toronto since 1843. The Great Lake levels are remarkably constant over the past century. No evidence was found in the frequency of extreme events like hurricanes or tornadoes were increasing. And also that the number of forest fires in Canada and Ontario decreased during 1990 to 2020. It's true, last year we had many more wildfires. And it's also true that quite a few arsonists have been found. Professor Van Wingarden's work also shows that Alberta's contribution to global warming over the past 100 years was 0.006 degrees Celsius. 
So that's six thousandths of a degree. So it doesn't look like we're the guilty party, does it? Now, over 140 scientists and scholars from Canada are signatory to the Clintel Declaration and over 1,890 international signatories. And <clears throat> full disclosure, I'm also a signatory, but that's because they made me an honorary signatory. Um, Clintel asked me to sign because I did um, a video. They issued a press release. I sent it to over 500 media outlets in Canada, mostly in Canada and some in the U.S., and nobody picked up the press release. At that time, it was 500 scientists who were signatory to the Clintel Declaration. Not one of them picked up the press release. So I decided to just simply read it on camera because we have quite a good following. And I thought, well, at least our people will know what Clintel wanted to tell them. And this press release came out just at the same time that Greta was at the UN berating everyone with, how dare you? Um, so it got over 700,000 views before Facebook started banning it. And so, like in honor of doing that, Clintel asked me to sign, and I did. Now the Clintel scientists prevent, present, the Clintel scientists present the full spectrum of climate research. And as you can see, climate is a very, very complex area because all these different factors, like I said at the beginning, it's a chaotic, nonlinear, uh, very complex system, uh, very dynamic. All these different factors are interacting all the time. So to say that only humans and only carbon dioxide, only from fossil fuel use, is the only reason that climate is changing, that's frankly absurd. And CBC should not be promoting propaganda, but rather should be bringing forward this information so we can have open civil debate on this topic. So the CBC Fifth Estate conflates extreme weather events and wildfires with climate change. They accept the claims of climate activists at face value with no serious questions asked. Though Canadian taxpayers fund CBC for $1.4 billion a year, it looks like CBC is working for CANRAC, that's the Climate Action Network, the Citizens Climate Lobby, and other environmental non-governmental organizations as a mouthpiece for their propaganda, instead of providing impartial and fact-based reporting to the public who pay for CBC's existence. And worst of all, CBC incites climate activist violence against critical infrastructure. That puts the Canadian public at risk. Serious risk. Very irresponsible. And a good example of that, a sad and tragic example of that, is what happened in Texas in uh, 2021, when a, a sudden, unexpected, extremely cold and snowy storm blew into Texas. Now these do happen there from time to time, but um, they, they have recently uh, phased out a lot of their coal power. They had added lots of wind and solar, and uh, they'd also electrified a lot of homes. So homes that normally would be heated by natural gas were being heated by electricity. So that increased the demand on the electrical grid. And of course, what happened is when the storm blew in, suddenly the wind dropped off. And 40% of Texas energy production shifted from wind to natural gas, boom, like that. Now on top of that, natural gas didn't perform well either because the natural gas facilities were not winterized. Um, so they weren't really prepared for this kind of inevitability even though they know historically that these kind of storms have happened there. But many people died. Now the official total is around 200, but in this article they suggest that the number is more like 700. And um, some of these, uh, some of the people were without power for, for weeks. Uh, some of the people who had big trucks that have 
little generators in the back. That's how they kept warm. They put their family in the truck and kept warm. They powered critical things in their house from the little generator that's in the back of their truck. And um, that's how they survived. So when infrastructure goes down, people die. So for CBC to put words in the mouth of Peter Kalmus and get him to more or less approve uh, of such action. And it's important to note that Peter Kalmus is a scientist who had chained himself to um, J.P. Morgan Bank in protest. He's an activist with Extinction Rebellion. I don't think we need to egg people on with these kinds of criminal activities uh, when we should actually be helping calm things down by presenting this kind of information to the public and to climate activists. Unfortunately, climate activism becomes an embedded part of a person's identity. So there's quite an interesting book called When Prophecy Fails, and it's actually looking at groups like uh, those who have apocalyptic visions, like the Raelians who were planning, they, they sold everything, they were planning to be boarded on a ship when it would come for them. That never happened. And when they researched these kinds of groups, these psychologists found that quite often people cling tighter to their ideology when the prophecy doesn't come true. So if we look at the climate history, we find over and over again we've been told that the Arctic will be ice-free by 2010, by 2013, that um, you know we won't know what snow is like anymore, um, on and on, all these kind of apocalyptic prophecies. And you'd think after all of the failures that we've seen that people would say, you know what, maybe these predictions are invalid. Maybe I should not live in the future, but rather in the present. Now, one person who was a climate activist and who did change is Michael Schellenberger. And of course, he's been labeled a denier ever since. <laughs> but his book is very good. And, and what happened? He was just heartbroken to see that his children had become terrified of climate change. And that's what really made him take a closer look and turn around and speak out against the climate catastrophe mass formation psychosis. That's really what it's become. So if we look at CBC's journalistic standards, they claim to be impartial. They say their reputation is the foundation of their credibility. Their primary allegiance is to the public. And we consider carefully what organizations we associate with. I would say based on what they did in Boiling Point Climate Chaos, that they breached every single one of these uh, standards. And if you think so, too, then please contact the CBC, the Fifth Estate, and tell them what you think, or contact uh, Jack Nagler, who's the CBC Ombudsman. Now, if you found that interesting, I hope that you'll support us. We're a very small nonprofit. We don't get government grants. We are funded by individual member donors. Most of our donations are under $100. You can become a member if you like. It's $40 a year or $80 for three years. Um, for that, you will receive our various newsletters like CLISI, which gives a roundup and summary of recent climate papers and gray reports, white papers, and, and um, you'll also get extracts, which is a roundup of international policy issues. We do a newsletter four times a year. We also have our press releases. You can subscribe or unsubscribe to any of these that you are interested in. And uh, we also have various events. So if you become a member, you're supporting our work. If you don't want to be a member, consider donating to us. We don't get $1.4 billion a year. And I think that I've been able to show you the information that we've gathered that the CBC could have and should have gathered to give you a more balanced picture on um, 
the boiling point, climate chaos. <laughs> so you can see there's no climate emergency. We do have time and we should really calm down the rhetoric because sadly somebody will probably get hurt if we don't. Anyway, thanks for listening to the presentation. I appreciate your support and thanks very much for the comments that people put in the comments below. I always flip back and have a look and see what people think, what they'd like to know. Um, so please feel free to comment, please subscribe, and please share our material with your family and friends. Thank you. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Mm -hmm.